Good morning and a very warm welcome to you on this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, which of course is Mothering Sunday. My name is Glenda Griffin and I'm one of the local preachers in this circuit. Mother's Day, a day of joy for many, a day of remembrance for some and sadly a day that brings only bad memories for others. And for all you mums out there who were treated to breakfast in bed this morning, I hope the toast wasn't too burnt. But let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the gift of mothers, whether birth mothers, adoptive mothers, or simply people who have been or are like a mother to us. Before we were even born, it was always your intention to surround us by love, not only by the love of those who gave birth to us, but also by your fatherly love. And so we thank you too for the gift of that love, a love so great that you sacrificed your only son so that our sin which separated us from you might be swept away, enabling us to rejoice in your fatherly compassion, your motherly comfort and the sense of peace and stability that comes with knowing that your son, our saviour Jesus, is also our brother and it is through him that we make this prayer today. Amen. Our first hymn speaks of the fatherhood of God and our adoption into his family. Father God, I wonder how I manage to exist without the knowledge of your fatherhood. Father God, I wonder how I manage to exist without the knowledge of You're there beside me I will sing your praises I will sing your praises I will sing your praises Forevermore And I will sing your praises I will sing your praises I will sing your praises for today is best known as the parable of the prodigal son, or in the modern versions, the lost son. It's a parable that deals not with mothers, but a father whose estranged son returns home hungry and dishevelled. His father meets him not with, I told you so, or you made your bed now lie in it, 
but rather he greets him with a big hug and a party. Even it within the family, Lara, my daughter, has kindly offered to read the passage for us today. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered all his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became very angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen. This parable has been mulled over and debated in so many ways over the years. I could talk to you today about the family inheritance laws during Jesus' day, the relevance of the pigs, the jealousy of the older son, or the desperation of, for freedom of the younger son, which caused him to leave home, and so on. But on this Mother's Day, I want to focus on the love of a father who gave his wayward son an unusually warm welcome home. And this does have relevance to Mother's Day because we all know that God is greater than gender. And there are verses in the Bible that remind us of this, verses likening him to a mother. The prophet Isaiah quotes God as saying to the people of Israel, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. Later, as Jesus mourns over Jerusalem, he uses the metaphor of a mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings for safety. Oh, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Way, way back, God chose a man called Abraham to be the forefather of a great nation. 
the people who God would love and bless as the father loves and blesses his children and who in return would love him. And if now you're thinking, oh no, not another history lesson, then don't because here's a story instead. There was a highly successful businessman. He had done well in business and had hundreds of people working for him. For many years, the empire he had created had been his life. But then he began to realise that something was missing. In short, he wanted to be loved. He'd had plenty of people say they loved him, but he knew it was an empty love, a love that was only professed for what its speaker could get from him. Now this man had seen people with their children and he knew the love of a child was unconditional. They weren't in it for the money. So he travelled abroad to where it was easier and he adopted a number of children. I'm not sure how many. Anyway, once back in England, he researched the best boarding school. He kitted them out in new uniforms and off they went. They hadn't been at school long before news began to filter back to him that they weren't happy. The other children were bullying them because they weren't English. They didn't like the meals the school was serving them. They simply weren't used to that kind of diet. And the teachers were making them do extra work in order that they might catch up with their English classmates. Soon the children were writing him letters pleading that he take them away from such a horrible place. The man was horrified to hear what was happening so he sent his number one assistant to the school with the order that they be brought back to his mansion. The man sold his empire, gave up work and stayed at home with the children. There he personally tutored them, fed them with food and goodies from their homeland, even if it was a little repetitive which made the children complain sometimes. He also made sure that they were well clothed and they longed for nothing. He gave them a lovely home, all they could ever want. But most importantly, he was always there for them, to protect them when the bullies attacked, to nurse them when they were ill. The only thing he asked of them was that they would obey the household rules. And these he wrote out on two pieces of card and he stuck them to the kitchen cabinets. There weren't many of them, less than a dozen, and they weren't hard to keep but the observance of them meant that the children would always be happy and prosperous. As time went on, the children grew up as children do, and they began to resent the rules. One by one, they broke them and they did their own thing. They ignored their adopted father, the father who adored them and loved them more than his life. One became hooked on drugs, and lied and cheated and stole to fund his habit. Another became a regular at the local pub and usually arrived home paralytic in the early hours of the morning, if he arrived home at all. Another didn't like how she looked and she spent large amounts of her father's money on cosmetic surgery until she resembled her favourite actress. Another fell in love with the rock band, followed them all around the country, listened to nothing but their music and had a portrait of the lead singer tattooed across her back. The youngest discovered online gambling and spent his days shut in his bedroom glued to the computer screen. The oldest emigrated to Australia, said he worshipped the sun and was going where it shone most. The father did everything he could to turn his children around. He hired therapists, doctors, ex-prisoners, reform junkies. He even asked a police officer friend to speak to them. But the children just laughed at these that the father sent, if not to their face, then certainly behind their backs. The father was in despair. He still loved his children and more than anything wanted to spend time with them, but they wanted nothing to do with him. Finally, he knew he'd done everything he could so he stepped back, let them get on with their lives as they chose, hoping that one day they would realise their mistakes and come back to him. The sad thing was he knew deep, deep down that many of them never would. If you're well versed in the Old Testament or dare I say it, Jewish history, 
then you would have recognised in that story the wealthy man as being God and the adopted children as the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, the people who God had made his own, watching over them, feeding them, clothing them, teaching them and protecting them. But his adoptive people didn't stay with him. They drifted away, ignored him and did their own thing to their detriment, just as the lost son in the parable Lara read did. God yearned for their return, just as the father in my story had, and just as the father in the parable had. Today, God has so many lost sons and daughters, people who are doing their own thing with no regard or recognition of the father who wants only good things for his children and who waits with open arms for their return. My mum and dad are now dead now. My mother died first and my dad died five years later. At his funeral, it struck me that I was now an orphan. Of course, being an orphan when you're grown up and perhaps have children of your own isn't anything nearly as traumatic as if you're still a child, or indeed if you've never known your parents. But it particularly struck home for me when I was looking through an old family album and I realised I didn't know who some of my ancestors were. It dawned on me then that I would never know. My parents weren't there for me to ask. But I was also aware of the words of Jesus spoken to the disciples just before his death. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Of course, Jesus was referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But it also reminded me that I had an eternal parent who would never leave me, never cease to love me, and who was always there for me, come rain or shine. I still didn't know who the people were in the photograph. But in comparison to the knowledge of my Heavenly Father, did that really matter? If you are like the lost son in our Bible reading, and I'm not just speaking to you guys out there, but to you all, if you're a lost child, then don't wait until you hit rock bottom, physically, mentally or spiritually. I do believe that now, more than at any other time, we need the protection of an all-powerful father who watches over us as a hen watches over her chicks and who longs to gather us up under the shelter of his all-powerful wings. If you're feeling lost, then please return to your eternal father today. Whatever you've done and however you're feeling, he's waiting with arms open wide. All you have to do is to run or walk or even to crawl into them and you'll receive a welcome and a hug, the kind of which you'll never have felt before. Amen. To give you time to reflect on what I've just said, here's a piece of music played by Lara. Some of the pictures are from the family albums I mentioned earlier and others I've shipped in. There's no people apart from the last slide, just animals that I can put a name to. And that will be followed by a short hymn to enable you to make a response to Abba Father. And if you've ever wondered, Abba is the Hebrew word that Jesus used when he addressed God. The nearest English equivalent that we have today is Daddy. Daddy, let me be yours and yours alone.
Let's come before our Abba Father now with our prayers for others and also for ourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on this Mothering Sunday, we give thanks for our mothers, people who nurtured us and cared for us when we were young, people who did their best for us, whatever the circumstances, people perhaps no longer with us, but who we remember with gratitude and fond memories, people still with us who we feel we can approach for advice and a hug when times are difficult. Father God, we pray for those who don't have such good memories of a mother, people who were left without a mother at a young age, people who only remember the abuse or neglect of a troubled mother, for those grieving for a lost childhood or filled with sadness today, grieving for a recently departed mother. Gracious Father, we pray that you will make yourself felt to them so that they may know they have an eternal Father who has always loved them and always will, despite anything that has happened in the past. Today we pray especially for the mothers of Ukraine, women who have left their menfolk behind to fight while they have made hazardous journeys with their children, seeking safety in foreign lands. We pray for their protection and ask that you grant them strength, courage and good health. But above all, we pray they will be surrounded by kind and loving people who will help them to find safe places to live with people who will help and console them until such a time as they can return home or be reunited with the rest of their families. Lord God, the definitions of mother are many and include Mother Earth, the earth you created for us to live on. An earth brimming over with good things and all we could possibly need to live happy and fulfilling lives. Yet we have abused your gift. Through greed we have plundered its resources and used them wastefully, polluting our oceans and causing temperature rises which in turn have resulted in flooding, drought, hurricanes, fires and earthquakes. We have not shared with one another with the result that some have far more than they need, while others have barely enough to survive. We no longer live in harmony with nature, or indeed with each other. Father, we've made a mess of it all, and it seems there's no way we can undo it. And so we pray for your mercy, place ourselves into your hands, and beg for help. Merciful Father, so many of us today know of people who are sick or suffering at home, in hospital or in hospice. And so we lift them to you now, asking that they may know your peace, your love and your healing in their lives. And finally, Father, on this day we pray for ourselves. May we always remember that you are the parent who always loves us, always wants the best for us and always waits with arms wide open and with a party prepared for when we return home to you. Do you make these prayers in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn is a lovely hymn of reassurance which speaks of the sovereignty of our Father in heaven. O Father, you are sovereign.
And so at the end of this service, it just leaves me to thank you all for logging on and for joining me today. And I leave you with John Rutter's lovely version of the ironic blessing, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. And it's sung by the Cathedral Choir of Abbey Church. <laughs>